Talking all things Florida Gators with David Waters of Gators Breakdown, a fantastic Florida Gators podcast. And again, he joins the show. David, appreciate you taking the time, my friend. What's going on? Hey, not much. Uh, just uh, a lot going on. Baseball getting ready to start. Florida doing well in the hardwood and uh, football spring. Hey, spring practice right around the corner. So, hey, the moniker of Gators Breakdown is there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. And it, and it holds true. David, on that note, I want to start on the hardwood because I, I think while it's it's natural for our attention first to go to football or certainly, like you mentioned, opening day around the corner. This Gators basketball team really coming on of late, right? A couple weeks ago, I don't think many people were talking about Florida as being a real threat or contender or even a team that could get on the bubble. Since that loss, January the 16th at Tennessee, which was an 85-66 to 66 loss, really tough game, Florida has won five of their last six games, including a win against Auburn over the weekend, 81 to 65, which by the way, the records and how Florida has owned Auburn has been, it's it's crazy, folks. If you have not looked into it, Auburn just cannot win in Gainesville. Uh, that stretch also includes a win at Kentucky in overtime against the arch rival Georgia. David, I'll ask you simply, what has clicked for Florida over the last couple of weeks that maybe was not clicking a couple of weeks ago? I think part of it's getting healthy. Um, they, they fought some injuries early in the season, kind of maybe messed with some of the team chemistry, but now been able to be getting hand locked in back. You know, he's been able to kind of insert himself as a big guy and, and really, you know, getting him back, I think it's kind of solidified. But to me, most importantly, it's been getting Riley Kugel, getting in his groove. I mean, you expect big things from him coming into this season and maybe not living up to expectations, but when they really needed him the most against Auburn, you know, and, and as you said, you know, here in Gainesville, maybe Florida didn't need it because uh, they get all the mojo here in Gainesville uh, against Auburn. But I, I, I think it's that it's getting healthy and really Riley, Riley Kugel. Look, he came on at the, toward the end of last year. That's why we expected big things from him this year. And now maybe doing that same thing again, as the season winds down, what many consider the best player on the team uh, maybe starts playing like it. And then Clayton there at, at point guard has just been uh, really carrying the team when Kugel hasn't necessarily been able to to do so. Clayton's kind of been that consistent for us. So I think, you know, just really good guard play uh, and getting healthy. Uh, I think everything's kind of just coming together. So, but now, you know, you got LSU coming up and when Florida beat Kentucky, well, they lost to Texas A&M right after that. So you get the big win versus Auburn and now you get LSU. It's kind of, can you keep the momentum going? I think it's the biggest question. David, how are Gator fans feeling early in the Todd Golden era? Because we all know the track record and the history with Scott Strickland and the hirings and how Florida fans feel. And we'll we'll get more into that a little bit later in the conversation. But it seems like it's so far so good with Todd Golden. I think so. Uh, a lot of questions, this call's coming from San Francisco. You're not, not knowing a whole lot about him, really. Uh, but then you you get the stamp of approval from Bruce Pearl, and I think that goes a long way in SEC circles a little bit. But um, it's these big wins lately, honestly. I think there has been that, is he the guy, is he not the guy? And now I think, you know, you you teeter on that. Okay, we we may have something here if you just get the consistency part of it down. So I think that's what what, what is pretty big. But if Florida just – if the Florida doesn't fall on their face, they'll be in the NCAA tournament. And I think, you know, for early on in Todd Golden's tenure, that's all you can really ask for. And now be just kind of build a, be able to build on this, not just a win over a big team and be the team you're supposed to next – I think if you end this season the way many think, build on this season and do some more uh, and be a perennial NCAA uh, basketball team coming up. David, in your opinion, what was the bigger win at Kentucky or the Auburn win over the weekend? Ooh, uh, I think anytime you win at Rupp. <laughs> I know Kentucky, they've struggled as of recently as well, but still – Kind of like Auburn. Uh, maybe this is good for a lot of SEC teams, but Auburn struggling at, in Gainesville, of course. It kind of goes for a lot of SEC teams going to Rupp. And a lot of teams, you know, the running joke might be, yeah, you start that game off 10 nothing already to Kentucky because they're going to get every call anyway. So, uh, But still, it, it is Kentucky. It was at Rupp. I think that was still the bigger one. And, David, you mentioned the difficulties of winning on the road. I think anytime you know, the SEC, as deep as it is, as good as it is, you go on the road and win. There's no such thing as a bad road victory in the SEC. You look at Florida's upcoming schedule. The time we're speaking tonight, the Gators are taking on LSU in Gainesville. Then you go to Georgia. Then you go to Alabama. We know how tough that one is. You've got at South Carolina down the stretch as well. 
realistically, David, in your mind, how far can this Gators team go? Do you think they can make a run and be an NCAA tournament team? Uh, I do. Uh, I think they're playing too well right now. Like I said, I think with those two big wins lately, they've kind of had to collapse not to make the tournament. Uh, so, uh, And they've had some pretty good fortune against former coach Mike White in Georgia so far, so maybe chalk that one up to a win already. But, I mean, that, don't overlook that South Carolina team. I think they are getting overlooked, and look, they're high in the standings, but maybe the, the net ratings aren't really loving them for whatever reason. Uh, but, you know, they're ranked. They're top of the SEC right now. I think uh, – Maybe because not a lot of people expected it, they're kind of getting overlooked at where they're at right now. But uh, don't, don't do not overlook that team right now, David. Before we get in the football side of things, like you mentioned, opening day is just around the corner this Friday. College baseball will begin. I'm a huge baseball guy myself. Really excited for what Kevin O'Sullivan down has has down in Gainesville this year. Your just quick thoughts on Florida baseball, obviously led by Jack Caglione. I mean, this should be a team that Florida, of course. Last year, got to the final, ran into the buzzsaw that was Paul Skeens, Dylan Cruz, that fantastic LSU team. But Florida now sitting number two in the rankings, and certainly it's Omaha on the mind of Gators everywhere. Your, your just overall thoughts on this Florida ball club, one that looks to be, I feel like if I can classify them by one word, it's power. Power in the lineup, power arms throughout the pitching staff. Yeah, I think that's what it is. They're going to score runs. Uh, so I think still the prevailing question will be, can they make up for – you know, losing some losing some pieces um, that, that that they lost last year. You know, uh, Brandon Sproke uh, out, so now you got to find a new number one. Is that Kaylee and Owen? Is that somebody else? That you know, that Florida, um, you know, what we'll they're out there. So really, really talented, as you mentioned, and look, all eyes. I mean, you got Jack Kaylee and Owen out there. All the eyes are going to be on him, and you know what he can do. It might end up being a top pick at some point in the MLB draft. So you know, can he continue to be that dual threat player that I think a lot of people really like the uniqueness of that and seeing a player be able to do that. Last year, he didn't have the spotlight on him coming into the season. This year, he does. So does it get to him? I mean, if you look at some of the preseason videos we're getting and some of the scrimmages Florida has, I mean, I think there's an echo still out there of one of the balls he's hit. I, I think that echo is still coming out of the state of Florida right now. So and, you know, Florida just extended O'Sullivan as well. You know, he enters his 17th season here for for, for the Gators and, and leading that ball club. I, I think the only complaint I think you might have is, you know, Florida recruits well and they recruit well every year. Maybe there should be some more titles into it. You mentioned how close they got last year uh, and falling short to LSU. So coming into the season, ranked number two, a lot of expectations, one of the best players in the country. I think this season might really just end up being, can Florida live up to the lofty expectation? David, I've mentioned this to a couple other people, but I'm sure you and your audience and Gators everywhere will appreciate this. I told somebody else, it's not truly college baseball season until Florida blows a 16-11 to 11 lead in the ninth <laughs> inning in a midweek game and loses 17 to 16 to Stetson or Jacksonville or South Florida, whoever it is. So I, I feel like you guys are going to chuckle to that because you feel it firsthand. I feel like every time I look up, no matter how good Florida is, there's just this game where the pitching staff gives up like an eight run lead in the eighth or ninth inning and that the yeah, game can find a way to lose. I, I don't know. It's just, it's tail as old as time, it seems like. It, it does seem that way, especially the way they're killing the ball lately, you know, and, and hitting all those home runs, as you say, get up to a big lead. But uh, Fisher, Peterson, Kaglin on this year kind of seem to be the three main guys in the rotation. So uh, they, they do have to figure out a little bit more, a little more consistency, I think, in the, uh, you know, to not necessarily, you know, they don't have to be dominant as long as they're scoring runs the way they did last year. Uh, but do probably, if they want to win at all, have to take another step in the, in the pitching department. David, let's talk Gators football. Craig Fitzgerald, strength and conditioning coach, has left Florida for Boston College. Big deal, little deal, or no deal for Billy Napier's program? Oh, I think there's a couple ways to look at that, not to take an easy way out here. Yeah, on the surface level, leaving Florida for Boston College, okay, that seems pretty bad. Uh, but when you take a little deeper look into it, and he's really, really close with Bill O'Brien. Him, They have been colleagues for years now. Uh, and look, he just left the New England Patriots, so he's been in that Boston area. This was a chance to go coach with one of his best friends and the area he just left where his kids went to school, his wife is from the Northeast. It makes sense when you dig a little deeper into it, but that still doesn't make up for the sting that, honestly, I mean, at this point, he is a new strength and conditioning coach at Florida. I probably couldn't have went and been the new strength and conditioning coach. You're going to get a whole lot of love just because it's the new guy and things are different. Uh, you have to wait till the fall to necessarily see how that plays out. 
Uh, but from everything we were here, and I had running back Trey on Webb on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, and he just lauded how different it was. And the last couple of he he was a freshman last year, so he he went back to last year. He said they felt more like a track team last year, and they were building more towards physicality, more towards strength conditioning uh, to compare to last year. So, uh, and I've heard some other players too laud you know just how different it was this year and uh, with Fitzgerald. So I, I think it will sting a bit because the players, from what I could tell, really really liked where this was going, uh, and they didn't really care for what was going on last year. So uh, I don't think Billy Napier will go back to Mark Hawk and bring him in just because he's still on staff in, in, in some way. Uh, so will it be another hire from within? Is there enough time to go outside and get somebody else right now to, to kind of take it? So they got five weeks with him. They went through their foundation stage to, to build where they're at right now. Uh, so all in all, I think from the players, you know, even going to social media, they had a little bit of a sad face emoji when they heard the news and they put it out there on social media. So I, I think they really like what was going on. Um, really probably for Billy Napier's about who he gets to replace Fitzgerald. David, I feel like every single day I get on social media, I see a new, whether it's Gator fan, Gator entity, what have you, sort of and I don't want to be overzealous here, but wallowing in misery, if you will, when talking about Gators football. I'll ask you this straight up, David, because, again, you go 5-7 and seven last year. The over-under win totals have come out 5.5 for Florida in 2024. We all know about the schedule. Have things reached a toxic level when it comes to Gators football in your mind? Because anybody who's been a fan of any team where, you know, a, a firing has occurred and you know going into that year when the firing happens – it can get to that level in your mind. I'm not saying necessarily internally, but like with the fan base, would you call the situation toxic in Gainesville? It's there. I won't necessarily say it's overwhelming, but you know, there are some parts of the fan base that can never be satisfied. Uh, but I do think it's reached a level to where it's gotten past that just a little bit. Um, Toxic may be too strong. Like, like I said, that is there I mean, at a small level. I think the most worrisome thing is apathy. It's just like, man, it, it, you go five and seven, you go six and seven the season before that, and it's uh, – and that, like I said, with the Fitzgerald storyline too, it's just like, what can happen next? Uh, you know, Every time it seems Billy Napier has some momentum, he hits a brick wall. I mean, for, you, season one – beat Utah, but then lose to Kentucky and you beat Texas A&M and South Carolina only to lose to Vanderbilt and Florida state this past season, you go into the Georgia game five and two then in the season on a five game losing streak. You had a great recruiting class built up, couldn't handle the momentum and that falls apart down the stretch. And so now lately it's just Fitzgerald. You had some momentum and strength and conditioning and then that goes away. So it just seems like every time there's something positive happening, the brakes get hit. Uh, so I think, some Gator Nation is just kind of just you know trepidation right now. Uh, they're kind of just moseying along and just wondering. It's kind of a wait and see approach, uh, maybe. Okay, if he does go out there and uh, overcome expectations, okay, I'll jump on board. But a lot of thing, a lot of views is like I don't know if that's going to happen. And like a lot of Gator fans don't want to jump on the bag bandwagon and say, "Well, I'm just going to be hurt again." I've heard that a lot. You know, I don't want to get my expectations up. Uh, so you, but look, I mean, you, Billy Napier's coming back. You, you bring back Graham Mertz, Montreal Johnson, Trey Wilson on the offensive side. Um, I think there's a lot to point to there. It's just a defense. I mean, as hard as the schedule is, it doesn't matter. I mean, this deep, we, we, we sit there and look at one side of the ball and it's, Hey, there's no way this defense can be worse than the year before. And they have found a way to do that three, four years in a row now. So it's no, nope, forget about the offense. If Billy Napier wants to have success, this coming up season, it is about fixing the defense. And I just think Gator Nations is is kind of tired of seeing that one side of the ball fail. So you bring in Ron Roberts to help along uh, Austin Armstrong. So there's some hope there right now. It's just a lot of Gator Nation is afraid to really jump on board right now. David, how much of it, too, is, you know, entering year three? Again, we talked about the over-under win totals five and a half, and, and we'll get to, like, record and what they need to do in a second. But how much of it, of it too, with Billy Napier is in year three – this football team and this football program needs to look the part. And what I mean by that is year two, I felt like you still saw a lot of year one mistakes, like guys yeah. wearing the same numbers on the field and special teams continues to be an issue. And I know Gator fans give Billy a lot of crap for having two offensive line coaches and not having an OC. And I mean, but how much of it is it just, even if you don't go 10 and two, 11 and one, like it needs to look the right way. And Florida needs to at least be doing 
the fundamental things, and for lack of a better way of putting it, not be a stupid football team. Yeah, I, I, think, that, I think that's part of it. You, you didn't think you were getting this in Billy Napier. You thought you were getting the team that would be uh, more in tune and more disciplined on game day, and whether it be players and whether it be coaches right now, you, you, they're that, that, that question still remains. And that should, after year two, okay, Florida played a lot of young guys last year, so you can excuse some of that. But it's the coaching decisions, and you know, maybe those things work together. But in year three, all that goes away. This is pretty much fully your team now. Not many Dan Mullen players left. The transfer portal exists. You brought in a lot of your players now. This a lot of your recruits. This team is Billy Napier's image right now. And if he's got this thing headed in the right direction, we'll see the results in, in year three. I know the schedule is hard, but if it's heading in the right direction, seven, eight wins is not out of the realm of possibility. But that means we know we got to see that it's heading in the right direction. Six wins doesn't tell us that. Five wins doesn't tell us that. It's got to be over 500, and you got to see some signs that, hey, offense is consistent from last year. You bring back a quarterback. You got to take advantage of that. And you made those staff changes on defense. That's got to play off. So I do think it's, well, for a lot of Gator Nation, is heading into year three, there's still a lot more questions than they thought they'd have at this point. Now, you can point to a lot of things that say, if it's going to be better, this is why, and we have to see it. So based off, David, what you just said, seven and five or better is the record. He more than likely needs to return. Six and six is not going to be enough. I say six and six is question. I, I think it is a truth to, in my opinion, I think it's a 50-50 shot he returns. Anything better than that, I, I'm pretty sure he's, he, he returns. Six and six, 50-50, lower than that, I would not be surprised if after three seasons, Billy Napier's gone. So what's the thought then, David, looking at the schedule? I mean, I, I, I don't know if Kirby Smart himself put this schedule together, but I mean, it is <laughs> – it is because you look at that schedule realistically, David. Samford's a win. Literally outside of that, everything is at minimum a toss-up. Like, and it's – that it's a crazy schedule. Like, I don't know – you know, you kick it off with Miami. I feel like that Texas A&M game early on is is massive, right? Year one coach and Mike Elko. You can't lose to Mike Elko. You just can't lose to a brand new coach in college. And I like Mike Elko, but, you know, the logistics of that or like the optics of that don't look great when you're year three, Billy Napier, year one, Mike Elko. Um, and so I, I, I'll go there. Is there a game with you, you look at that schedule and it's like, Maybe it's early on or, or whatever game it is that Billy Napier's got to have this football game to have a shot to hit that seven wins and come back in 2025. I hate to start a season, but my, the Miami game's huge. I mean, you got Mar Mario Cristobal's in his third year as well, and there's a ton of questions surrounding Miami. It is an in state rival. A lot of players on that roster of guys that you went head to head in the recruiting wars with Mario Cristobal with. So, I think that's a huge game for both guys. So I, of course, I, I'll start right there at that first game of the season. It's going to get – look, he certainly has some time to bounce back from that, but it's going to get really loud if he loses that opening game to Mario Cristobal in Miami and have to bounce back from that already. The Sanford game the next week won't mean anything. You can go out there and beat him 100 to nothing. Everybody's going to overlook that because you lost to Miami and didn't have a chance to bounce back uh, against Texas A&M two weeks later after that Miami game. You start the season, three straight home games, Miami, Sanford, Texas A&M. Go 3-0 you know, to start that, and you start getting some good feelings heading into Starkville, Mississippi State. A good chance to start 4-0. and Then you return back to get UCF, another in-state school. You can't lose, even though K.J. Jefferson's going there, and he, he came to the Swamp and beat you last year with Arkansas. Um, so there, there's a path there. You get that Miami win. It creates some momentum because that's some – it's a momentum Florida probably has to have. You've got to build some equity in the first half of the season because of that brutal November Florida has with, off the top of my head, Georgia, Texas, Ole Miss, LSU, Florida State. All of those teams were fighting for conference championships, college football playoff spots this past season, and you got all five of them in a row in November. So you've got to build some equity. You can't go 0-5 like you did in November last year. You've got to steal a win. But to get probably to that seven-win mark, you've got to build some equity in the first half of the season. And, David, it's just crazy to think that, you know, you, you mentioned that Miami game and how much that can sway. You know, we're talking about, is Florida going to make a bowl game? If they beat Miami, it's can they start 5-0? and So it's, it's really yeah. like, you know, one way or the other, the extremes, if you will. Uh, David, what were your thoughts on that over-under five-and-a-half win total? Does that feel fair to you after last year? Is that a little bit low? 
a little bit high, God forbid. I don't see how. But, I mean, <laughs> your thoughts on five and a half coming from Vegas? I thought it was perfect. Um, Gator Nation may not want to admit that, but that's where – you were five and a half last year with an easier schedule. Mm-hmm. Now you're five and a half with a much harder schedule. The way it looks right now, the may, maybe, the, maybe the schedule doesn't turn out that hard. Uh, but we, as we sit here in February and forecast it, is anybody really expecting Georgia to take a dip? Texas to take a dip. Ole Miss, I mean, Ole Miss probably is better than they were last year. Florida State probably will take a dip. I mean, you know, that they, they they lose a lot. So that's probably the only team in that five game stretch. LSU, I guess, losing Jaden Daniels, but Nussmeyer there too. So LSU, FSU, okay, maybe take a step back, but in a lot of ways, can still be better than Florida. Uh, so maybe the schedule isn't as tough, but five and a half, I think, based on what we saw last year, it was kind of our. Maybe Vegas, I don't think Vegas does a lot of research. They didn't take an easy way out, but five and a half matching last year's and with an easier schedule, putting it to this harder schedule. Maybe that's in some ways saying Florida's a better team, but the record may not show it. That doesn't matter in year three for Billy Navy. It doesn't matter if you technically, you can lose all those November games by one point. The generation still not going to be happy uh, because of what happened last year and the way you fell apart in November. So uh, five and a half, I thought was right on the mark uh, there. And, um, Right now, I think the early returns are a lot of people are hitting the under <laughs> on that uh, from, from what I get, from, from what I've seen. So uh, based off of last year, shouldn't be any surprise. David, you know, a really fascinating conversation of the transfer portal in IL era is how long should coaches get to turn a program around or get a program going? And I think it's a program by program basis, right? I think there's obviously there's different expectations in Gainesville than there are in Starkville, right? We all know that, but with this Billy Napier situation, I feel like it's a really interesting case study because I think, again, to your point, they miss a bowl game, he's out, it'll be three years and done. Would you say in Gainesville that is the window for the new head coach, the next head coach, forever and ever, amen? You got three years to get it going. You're going to get those three full years, but you're not going to get more than that if you don't see real progress by the end of year three. And most folks believe year three is the year where you really do find out what you have, that's the year that if a head coach is going to pop, his program is going to pop, that's when it happens. Would you agree, disagree with that sentiment? Your thoughts on does that fit for the Florida head coaching job? I think so. I think three years gives you plenty of time, especially in today's college football with the transfer portal and and all that. You can build the team faster in your image. And now fully admit I don't know if a Gator coach has ever walked into a stretch with a harder schedule. You know, Florida have faced Utah the last couple of years. Uh, you, we, we've talked about this year's schedule. No doubt, Billy Napier has walked into a tough situation. But go back to a point I made earlier. If this thing is headed in the right direction, you will you should be able to see it uh, in, in year three. So, you know, Billy Napier came into Florida, and he chose not to go a heavy transfer portal route to begin with to – you know, to flip the roster completely in his image. He wanted to go through high school recruiting. He wanted to to build the culture there. And look, we saw that may not pay off. One of your best players, Trevor Etienne, going to Georgia, going to your biggest rival. And that's a guy that you were expecting to bank on in year three to, to help carry this team, to help take that next step. And now he's going and playing for your biggest rival. So uh, I think Billy Napier probably did have a hard realization is this new world of college football right now, it ain't, it, look, the culture, the relationship building, it can still go a long way. Don't get me wrong. But it may not matter as much as it did at Louisiana in the Sun Belt and pre-NIL. It's a new world right now. And I think that probably you know hit Billy Napier a little bit more than he thought it would uh, coming up. So I do think three years is enough time. You know, we talked about record. If, you, if you're hovering around six and six, you know, you got – if you're going to overcome expectations, one way to do that is have that electric, big-time quarterback. He has DJ Lagway in the fold. Is that enough? If you go six and six, six and six, and you maybe see enough from DJ Lagway this year to say, all right, he is a difference maker. We want to build around him. I do think a lot can be said for giving Billy Napier, and now we, we kind of be crazy now, going into year four, the first time we see him with his hand picked recruited quarterback. Is that enough to say, all right, we'll give him time to see what he has with DJ Lagway? And that may be enough to say, all right, we'll, we'll go past the three-year window. We'll give you one more because of who you've recruited. But, you know, year four, you, you better show something fast. You got DJ Lagway at the quarterback spot, the most important spot on the field. Go show us something. So, David, Graham Mertz returns this year. Would you expect DJ Lagway, though, to play a lot? Do you think there's any sorts of 
quarterback competition, dare I say? Is Graham Mertz going to be feeling the heat behind him, or is it one of those things where Lagway has certain packages and there's certain moments where you expect him to insert into the game? Yeah, I think it's more the latter. Uh, I've, uh, Graham Mertz coming back, uh, I think it would be benefit to Billy Napier. I think it's benefit to him uh, to have his second year there. Brings a brings in a, a, re, a receiver from Wisconsin, Chimray DK, who was there. To, they were there two years ago together, uh, and Chimray DK had his best season as a college football player a couple years ago with Graham Mertz at Wisconsin. So uh, I think there's a, a lot to be made for Graham Mertz coming back uh, for for Billy Napier here. Uh, packages, as you said, I, I, red zone. Third and short situations, we all probably for not being creative enough, we're we'll all throw out the Kenny B, Tim Tebow, and Chris Leak in 2006. I think everybody remembers that package and Tim Tebow's freshman year. Can it be something like that? Can he be that impactful way where it may not be a high number of snaps, but those snaps are really meaningful when he comes in? Um, if DJ Lagway, I mean, look, he's got to go out there and earn it. He's got to go out there and prove it. I, do, I, I don't think. Will it be a true competition? Sure. It's not one I think Graham Mertz will give up. I think he is the guy. Uh, but there are certain situations I do think DJ Lagway can really help this team if he earns it. David Waters, Gators Breakdown, one of the best in the business when it comes to talking all things for the Gators. David, let folks know where they can check out all your work. Yeah, GatorsBreakdown.com, and uh, you can find links to the uh, episodes, uh, YouTube form, uh, podcast form. Uh, articles there at GatorsBreakdown.com, and you can follow me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Dave, appreciate you taking the time, my friend. Let's definitely do it again soon. For sure, for sure. Thanks for having me.